Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the exciting opportunity to chat with Ashley Granter, ecological designer and co-founder of Natura Design. Growing up with a passion for design and for nature, Ashley graduated with first-class bachelor's for product design at Sheffield Hallam University. After school, he began working as a freelance ecological designer, moving into the field of mycology for clients such as Sebastian Cox, Biome, that's B-I-O-H-M, and Design Futures, as well as teaching classes and workshops for universities such as the Royal College of Arts and Central St. Martins. Ashley ended up reconnecting with his Sheffield Hallam classmate, Samuel Heath, and together started their design company, Natura. I see their company as really exploring a fungal vision for the future as they work with the ecosystem by redesigning current biosystems to be capable of producing materials and objects to fill our lives. These systems disrupt wasteful processes by turning unwanted resources into beautiful products. By working with mycelium, they're creating objects of natural beauty that help the environment rather than harm it. I'm really excited to speak with one of the visionaries who is inoculating our modern design and production systems and repurposing them to create more of a mushroom planet. Coming to us from the UK, Ashley, it's great to have you on the show. It's great. Pleasure to be here. Couldn't have said those words about myself. Well, you kind of did say them because I pulled a lot of it from your website. But it's okay. I... It's okay. I won't say <laughs> plagiarism. <laughs> well, I did read your website, read more about you. I'm really appreciative that you reached out. I think your work is super exciting. And as we were talking about before the show, I think biomaterials or use of mycelium, which is kind of that vegetative network under the ground that spawns the mushrooms that we all love, that the that use of mycelium is really inspiring and one of the frontiers of using mushrooms in new ways that's really going to, that will change the planet. So we're going to talk about all that, all the cool things. I want to pick your brain about everything when it comes to mycelial design. Why don't we start off with, though, kind of what was your background that brought you to a place, maybe that brought you to a place in design, maybe a little story of how you got into mushrooms. How did how did this all come together? The story of Ashley, if you will. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a bit of a strange one. I'm still trying to pick it apart myself. Um but uh, starting from a design point of view, I've always been interested in building things and creating and designing. Um, and I didn't realize at the time that that could be a career uh, or something you could study at uni. Um, so a lot of my childhood was spent trying to find what the best sort of classes were to go to, to secure a good career and so on. Um, but then something close to the, the end of my, my course or the end of my time at school, something switched in my brain that started following things that I was passionate about and that I enjoyed doing rather than worrying about the consequences of it. And I've taken that ethos all the way up until now. Um, so I studied product design at um, Sheffield Harlem University, um, working on all sorts of materials, but I started to lean towards sustainable design and having more of a, a mindset with how um, we're so sort of impacting the planet both positively and negatively. And um, then somehow uh, I found mushrooms and uh, I infected myself uh, unknowingly and have become a, uh, a champion of uh, fungal materials since. Um, right. So it's been a bit of a strange, uh, strange path. I'm not really sure where I turned off the, uh, off the road and went onto the dirt track um, to go find those mushrooms, but it's been a been an awesome experience so far. Well, and I was really curious too about kind of the university or the academic setting, if more sustainable or or ecologically minded design principles are coming into the fold. I mean, I imagine they must be. And as we were talking before the show, the implications of studying just sustainable design, especially at the materials level laces out myceliates out if you will into so many different disciplines so many different industries mm -hmm. so i i wondered if there might be like a wave academically that you may have been part of or on the leading edge of that is starting to examine more and more of the sustainability of the entire design process 
novel organic materials. Is that something you're seeing kind of increasing in, in prominence? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I was at university, the, the course that I was on, it was very unique in the way that you could swap between fields within the whole design industry. So if you wanted wow. to do graphics design or furniture or anything like that, you could swap really freely. Um, and for our final uh, year at uh, university, we our first minor projects, we had the ability to choose between briefs, but our final major project was all self-run. So it was all about what you were passionate about, what you wanted to make as your your sort of uh, epitome of, of of your education system. And for me at the time, it was um, I, I'm an avid scuba diver. I've been diving since I was 12, uh -huh. and I'd seen an increase in the amount of plastics in the ocean. Um, and it happened to coincide with the Blue Planet uh, series by David Attenborough talking about uh, how. Uh, how we're having an impact on the planet, right. especially with the, the ocean plastics. So since about then, the biodesign or the sustainable industries have, have really sort of multiplied since then. And um, for myself, I, I have done workshops and, and lectures at uh, Royal College of Arts or Central St. Martins, which are the two main universities now in, in the UK, which are... Um, jumping into biodesign and um, using sort of biotechnology and living organisms as a mechanism and a production for materials or all sorts of uh, functions and applications, not necessarily materials. Uh, right. It could be like health and well-being and things like that. Um, so there's definitely been a huge shift in, in the UK, especially so in, in London. London's always been very sensitive to uh, new although i hate to say this word trends um for example like veganism and things like that but right it's, it's taken on quite a good tack when it comes to design and, and bio uh, bio design it's uh, been taken quite freely without much resistance um although we, we've yet to get over the uh, uh mushroom phobia um of uh, someone holding a product made out of mushrooms but that's a challenge that i i look forward to slowly overcoming um it's always uh, good to go to festivals and stuff where people are already interested in mushrooms and then they see the right. materials and they already have an acceptance of it compared to the gut reaction you see from uh, most of the, the population where they're either half intrigued or half disgusted. And it's, it's fun to sort of play between those levels and see if you can persuade them to bring something like that into their home. So, yeah. Well, I think that's a really interesting point. You know, I think, from talking to several people in England that I've gotten the opportunity to, it seems like there might be a shift going on. I mean, mushrooms are just so high on the collective consciousness right now in America and the UK, which are kind of inexorably linked culturally. It seems to be like a huge rise in awareness, a huge rise in the understanding of mushrooms. So I would imagine England would eventually have to start moving the needle away from mycophobia, more toward mycophilia. And I think the applications of how you're using mycelium, where it's not the mushroom fruiting body, it's the actual mycelium growing into a material. That's one of those novel uses that I think inspires people more than any other when I get people mm -hmm. excited about mushrooms, you know, you've kind of got your go-to statistics. You say, if people are like, why should I care about mushrooms? Well, this, 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 mm -hmm. this. And then you get to materials. You can make leather out of it. You can make buildings out of it. You can make, you know, people are like, whoa, hold on, out of mushrooms? Like, well, my seal. And it, it just extends the conversation and kind of opens people's minds up for, hey, I get it. You don't like mushrooms. Yes, there are mushrooms that are poisonous, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about as, as, part of the huge range Kingdom Fungi offers as this incredibly amazing use that applies to all these things. And I think that if any discipline or, or any method of working with fungi can open people up to more of an acceptance, I would think what you're doing is one of those key things. And just to circle back a little bit too on what you said about pursuing your passion. God, I'm glad you did. I'm really glad you I mean, made that choice. Every single day I wake up, I'm smiling, being able to just... <laughs> go into the lab and do some agar plates and just look after the mushroom babies as such. Um, it's, it's like gardening, but there's actually a career you can make a good living off of now. It's, yeah. uh, I, I've always been a gardener myself, uh, not just mushrooms. So it's always been a passion to, to work in almost agricultural ways, but, um, 
to be in in a sector that's kind of emerging in a way that you're growing your own furniture it uh it's quite a peculiar um uh little bubble to be in and as well just to to go on what you were saying about um acceptance of of mycelium and and mushroom materials one thing that i've started to notice and also i i sort of teach people about is a lot of the time now with sustainable products and materials or anything sustainable the the terms like biodegradable and things like that are thrown around but people don't actually know what goes into those materials it's you know weird chemicals or things they don't really understand whereas right. if you say to someone this has been grown from a mushroom similar to like if you had a chair made of wood it's been grown from a tree you know where that's come from that's completely natural there hasn't been anything tinkered behind the backs and you can trust that it will degrade because it's it's nature um right. so it's a lot more accessible for people to understand where it's coming from and, and you know it, people might be disgusted about mushrooms but they know that is an honest material. Yes. I, I don't think you get more natural or more compostable than than fungi. And I think you're a great example. This is something I've talked about with a few different guests. A great example of Western countries circling back into what we call here STEMs, uh, science, technology, yeah, engineering, technology mathematics. Engineering. Yep. And, and I think green STEM is really such a huge part of the future. Uh, and people may not, just because it, with something so new, you may not see that career path when you go to school. You're Like mm -hmm. you're saying, how can I use this to develop a career? Well, it's emerging. And if you pursue your passion into this emerging field, you're going to end up at the forefront. You're going to find a place to fit in. I was talking with someone in New York, uh, New York City, who is saying that we're actually having a brain drain where so many scientists, engineers, people that have this these skill sets you would need for these novel like biomaterials or bi these different applications are moving into finance because they have these great analytical mindsets they've got, and they just don't see a career. So they kind of move over to, to where the money is, as it were. But I encourage people to really pursue, especially if it's something related to ecology or regenerative, restorative design, really pursue it because it is going to be the future, it, almost out of necessity. I mean, we, like you're saying, we're buried in ocean plastics. We're buried in landfills full of materials that aren't degrading. At some point, we're going to need to find a way to use biomass to re- I don't know what I want to say here, but like re rebalance, rebalance. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. All the materials that aren't degrading are here. We're going to have to do something about it, not just keep that cycle going. So I, I, I guess what I'm saying is you're a great example to people of how that works. And it's something I always encourage people. Like I have aunts, uncles, cousins, people with young kids. I'm like, Hey, you should encourage them to get into the kind of fields you're in, the kind of fields you're talking about, because it really is the future. And it really has a huge rewarding uh, potential there. Yeah, I mean, even just any sort of field that's based in nature, because it, it's a common fact that you build up a appreciation for something that you study and work alongside, and you're less likely yeah. to to harm and damage it if you if you understand that. You know, you become a lot more aware of um, of your surroundings. Like before, before I was interested in mushrooms, I could walk around in a forest, appreciate the uh, you know the nature, but not once did I ever really pick out a mushroom from vision because I wasn't looking for that kind of thing. Whereas coming back to it, I, I walk in a forest and it takes me a long time to cover a short amount of distance because it's just chasing those mushrooms, trying to get those furrows and just thinking like, how can I use this and what kind of properties does it have that I could sort of bend to create weird kind of objects and, and shapes. Oh, and so, as we were talking about mushrooms and biomaterials, yeah, that's something I was really interested in. You said that your foraging interest has been for foraging for materials, not mm -hmm. for as much gourmet medicinal. So what's that like when you're out foraging for materials? What are you looking for? What do you, how, how does that work? So, so it's a lot of uh, speculative and slow waiting work where, uh, where I live, there's a lot of forest. So there's spots where I know there is, is uh, certain species of fungi growing. And I'll spend a lot of time watching how they grow, like what kind of speed of growth are they growing on materials, which are like substrates, which are peculiar, uh, for example, like a chemically treated wooden bench, you know, that will, would show uh, the ability to, to break down sort of heavy, uh, well, not heavy metals like toxins and, and even fungicides. Um, other features to look for are like weird colors and things like that. 
and just the strength of the the mushroom itself um for example uh like reishi and um Formis fomentarius they are like uh, conchs and the material strength of the the conch body itself is really really dense right. and they used to make uh well they still do make armadou from horseshoe fungus from Formis fomentarius to to create hats like paul paul stanett's hat right. um so these these mushroom fruit bodies themselves are already showing um, great potential as materials uh, but the actual mycelium takes on a lot of those same characteristics when it's growing so these are things that we can sort of uh, rely upon uh, to to then experiment with um, for example reishi uh, ganoderma um, lucidium in the in a agar plate the mycelium is so uh, strong and so tightly knit that it's hard to cut with a scalpel blade so then wow, really? you know, yeah, exactly. So then you, you can kind of take a hazardous guess that when you get that to grow for a substrate, it's going to be pretty strong material. Um, so the, looking for like characteristics like that, but it's certainly a peculiar uh, weekend to spend out in the woods because um, <laughs> usually I'll uh, drive to a forest in, in, in my van with a full little mini lab kit set up um i'll get the the agar cooking and the pressure cooker as i uh as the park up go foraging for some mushrooms come back pour the agar let it set and then i'll do some wild isolations in the van in the forest uh and then head back home with a, a new collection of, of mushrooms to experiment with so it's uh certainly peculiar that sounds like the coolest thing ever but you're like a mobile mad mushroom scientist exactly exactly <laughs> i just want a trailer now to have a full like pre-built lab ready to go oh that's like a cdc van <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's amazing and i've heard whenever i hear about people sampling mushrooms from the wild you do have that question of you know how sterile that like how do you do it basically do you have to get the fruit body back i've done a little bit of uh wild kind of sampling on the agar and usually mm -hmm. if you bring the fruit body and then you have to like under the flow hood, split it in half, get a chunk out of the very middle that hasn't obviously touched the outside air or anything. Uh, but then I've heard some people who say they have brought agar plates out into the field and mm -hmm. literally pull it out, unseal it, take try to scrape off a little piece of mycelium from a log and throw it in there. And that's worked for them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the dream scenario is to have a van or a trailer that has your own lab in it. That's yeah. really, really cool. And I think yeah, it's really I mean, cool too how you're looking for the mushrooms. So you're not looking for fruit <laughs> body. You're like, what is it growing on? What it, that's that's yeah. fascinating. I mean, it, it gives a lot of insight into to how it operates. Like oyster mushrooms in the industry is known to be really good at digesting food waste, which is highly nutritious, like uh, coffee grounds and things like that. Right. So generally, oyster mushrooms are, are quite resilient with uh, digesting a wide range of things. So why not use that skill to digest I don't know, bamboo or things like that where it's a waste stream that isn't a common sort of food source for a mushroom but you can train them to digest these varying substrates um, and it goes into the extreme of how much you can train them uh, I mean you can train them for different characteristics of growth so if you were producing uh, say mushroom fruit bodies you could get different styles different colors and, and sort of selectively breed them that way but from a more of a digestion point of view, you can even uh, start teaching it to digest plastics. Um, right. You can they produce enzymes to to break down the complex hydrocarbons of the polymers into uh, just sort of base organic chemicals. Which you know you could take some plastic, grow some mushrooms on it, let it break it down, and then eat the whole thing, and there would be no side effect to you. That's always insane to me the fact that mushrooms are such amazing chemists they're able mm -hmm. to synthesize and pump out chemicals on the outside of their hyphae tips and their mycelium body that's able to then go out and break down the molecules of yeah. you know even if it's a plastic substrate and eat it and repurpose it down to the molecular level so it's remaking that into more mycelium i whenever i explain that process to people that just blows people's minds away i've had mm. people just say that's not how it works it can't be how it works and i'm like no they're yeah. really there are these amazing chemists that we have around us all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I see them as like uh, the set of witches or wizards in the forest just with this pot of this cauldron, just trying different things. It's like, will this digest it? Kind of I thing. love that. And it's, uh, I mean, the, my understanding of the, the biology side of things in depth is, is not as good as 
typical mycologist because I'm, I'm design trained rather than biology trained. Right. But what I lack in science study, I gain for sort of wackiness and intuition of mixing things that probably shouldn't work together to then yeah. try and come up with these kind of, uh, sort of solutions to, to these problems. So, I mean, I'm hoping in, you know, five, 10 years, you'll have a compost bin for organic food and then you'll have a compost bin for plastics, which would be, you know, mind blowing to that's, see that. That's the future that we need. And I think mycology, because it is at least in the West, such a newer field, especially with the applications we're talking about as a material, as a digester, I think it is so new that it gives people an opportunity to try out new ideas. Like it's this, it's this, I don't want to say, I mean, it is kind of like a sandbox of science where everyone can contribute what they're bringing to the table. And even, you know, there, there aren't such norms or rote procedures that dictate um, everyone's use or exploration of the science to the point where new people, citizen scientists, people that aren't trained as mycologists can have ideas that might seem out there, but because there isn't like this tight grasp of, I guess what I want to say is like orthodoxy on it yet like all these ideas come out of left field and that really helps expand the science. And I'm sure in the early days of most sciences, that's how it was. I mean, you had people who weren't professional scientists who were contributing ideas, just what if I can apply this to this uh, and thinking in different ways that really expands the limit of what's possible. And that's what I had in my notes here for you is like, you're really expanding the limits with your work of what's possible. And so after we're hearing about all this, I do want to talk about some of the applications of mycelium. I think the digestion one's really interesting. Um, the application of uh, mycelium to commercial waste streams, you know, and I've always thought about. You hear people like uh, Trad Cotter, different people talk about blocks of mycelium you could run water through or wastewater mm-hmm. through that could filter Filtration it out. Systems, yeah, yeah. So I guess starting there and then ballooning out into like products and all the different things. But what are some of the applications of, I guess we're more in the realm of micro remediation, but mycelium as a material to help with waste streams. What are some of the cool ways they could be applied there? I mean, the, the ability to digest the varying amount of substrates is the, the, the unique and uh, powerful thing about mycelium because you can take waste uh, streams, for example, one of the products that we do at the moment, it uses spoon carving waste. So it's kind of a, the, the objects are, are these decorative bowls. So it's like a spoon to bowl kind of system, but it's using a, a waste which would typically be, uh, be burned, tossed or incinerated. Uh, and you're actually putting it into a new lease of life where sure you could have made it from scratch, but the fact that you have this open resource available, uh, it's just a, a missed opportunity that needs to be tapped into more. Right. Um, and I mean, for the most part, a lot of companies pay to get rid of their waste right. at the moment. So it's, you know, it, it seems silly that they're not seeing this as a resource themselves and, and start trying to sort of uh, do more research themselves into what their waste streams could be used for. And then maybe off of that, it becomes a little ecosystem where you have another smaller sub company that is actually turning that waste into new products uh, and you create almost a a circular loop on on the production. Um, That's probably where we will start heading towards uh, in the next couple of years for sure because the amount of pressure that's being put on the industries um, like companies like Coca-Cola and things like that to reduce plastic waste, they're probably out searching left, right and center for a solution that is is good for business but good good for the planet too. Um, and when it comes to applications of, of micro materials, I have yet to find a limit apart from things where, well, let's say garden furniture, uh, yeah. because you know, you, you put it in the garden and it wants to return to nature. <laughs> sure, um, sure. but anywhere outside of the garden, um, you know, you've got textiles, you've got solid materials, you could do everything from tables, chairs, the strength of the, the products can be massive where I can stand on a small cylinder about the size of a two liter bottle, put all my weight on it and it will support me completely uh, without any sort of breakage or anything. And the, the strength of, of these guys is immense. Uh, and we, we have only tickled the iceberg, the, the mushroom shaped iceberg for sure, because I mean, there is 
15,000 species that have been cataloged, but predicted to be 2 million different types of species on the planet. So then think about, we've only tickled less than 0.000 of a percent. We need like a million Ashleys out in the world to explore all these different species now. Exactly. That's why I'm trying to clone myself using mushroom (laughs) (laughs) time. That's the next level of myco materials, human clones. Uh, (laughs) Well, that, that was, you just hit all the points on my list that I think really inspire me when I think of mushroom materials. I think another big one that I had seen that is always kind of like a hope we could have mushroom cities is the idea of using it as like a building material, like Mm -hmm. Rishi building blocks. And I've even seen applications where it can be used as insulation for homes, you know, where you have your wall cavity that you typically put some nasty synthetic insulation. You could bake a giant sheet of mycelium and put it in there. Now questions come into my mind, like will it biodegrade or will it, you know, what if it's not, um, all the way dead or something. It starts fruiting mushrooms out of your wall anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think those applications are just so inspiring. Like you said, the limit is, well, it's, it's limitless. One really mm-hmm. cool one that I saw that I know there may be a university here in California, kind of heard through a friend of a friend, they're researching the electrical conductivity and mm-hmm. the use of Principal mushrooms. Circuits. Yeah. Yes. What is that all about? I wondered if you knew about that. I mean, the, the, it started um, a couple of years ago with slime molds um, because you could train them to solve mazes and things like that. And right. from that, uh, there was an inspiration for, you know, what if you could grow your own circuit where and then you, you place a little oak kernel on the points you want to solder to and this uh, slime mold or mycelium, uh, which can contain high levels of metals without harming the mycelium, could then grow out and connect up with these systems. So mycelium is mostly water, but it can also hold heavy metals um, and and standard metals in within itself. So you could wow. uh, sort of create a network system that way. The the only biggest problem is just controlling it because it just wants to keep growing everywhere. Uh, yeah, it doesn't yeah. want to necessarily go for one straight route to a certain spot. Um, Slime molds are the the more adapted for that. But um, even they like to spread out first and then go, mm, okay, we'll go with this, with, with this route. So um, sort of how you manipulate and control that is going to be the biggest question for, for that university and, and for anyone sort of studying in that kind of field as well. It's um, mushrooms grow how they want to grow. Uh, so how do you use that for a benefit? So right. it's, it's like a tree, you know, you, you can do as much as you want to try and grow it in a certain way, grow it in a certain speed. But at the end of the day, it it grows how it wants to. Um, So you've got to work within the parameters that the mushroom sets, not the parameters you're trying to set. So, yeah. I think that's a really, really important distinction. Uh, And I think that seems intuitively like, yeah, of course, but it is important to remember that these things are intelligent beings with minds of their own. They want to go where they want to go. Uh, So in working with them, you have to take that, take that into consideration. And I also really liked what you said about mycelium being able to contain metals within it. And I'd heard this about like neutralizing heavy metals or sinking heavy metals. Do you know, and I know you said, you know, I'm not a biologist, but do you know the, the, how that works, how they're able to sink heavy metals into them without damaging the mycelium? Is this, what's the unique property that leads to that, if you know it? I mean, I don't know it, but I could speculate. Okay. Um, I mean, a lot of the for example, like polymers and plastics, they are still from a baseline organic, whereas heavy metals uh, are strictly inorganic. Um, how they protect themselves from that, I'm not too sure. Um, right. But uh, they they like to chew up everything they can find, even if they're not sure they can digest it. They're just like, mm, I'll have a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, and <laughs> the, 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 the greedy blunts. mushrooms at the end no. of the day. Right. Like little gremlins. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, as for the, the science behind it, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be too sure, but I'm sure a little quick Google, um, right, on, right, uh, right. on that would uh, come up with a lot of research papers. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, th- I think it's just interesting to understand that concept and to mm-hmm. think that it in the context of the printable circuits we're talking about mm-hmm. that mycelium could actually consume, you could expose it to some kind of metal that you'd use as a conductor and then mm-hmm. have it grow through the circuit that's like science fiction, bioorganic. It's really, 
really cool. Now, one question I had as a for all the applications we talked about is the challenges of scalability. Uh, so, in general, I think it takes. I mean, a lot of mycelial mass, but you can set me straight on this, is the amount of mycelium you need to grow a chair, is it not that much? Does it not take that long? And when we talk about, you know, everyone having furniture or clothing made out of mycelium, what kind of, I guess, effort in terms of like capacity for farming the different mycelium and like, what does that really take? Are we going to need massive mycelium farms on the scale of like industrial agriculture to make that happen? So... With the uh, amount of mycelium required, it's it's relatively a small percentage when it comes to the overall makeup of the product. The mycelium uh, acts as like a natural organic binder to like tether things together, because okay. as it's spreading, it, it's keeping all the the shape together, which is a a uh, what would you call it a function they developed when growing naturally. For example, if you had uh, a tree with quite thick bark, they would try and digest everything within it whilst holding the structure to then break it down because within that structure, they're safer than if it was chipped up into powder. Um, right. So it's, it's using that natural ability that it, it's already honed um, as, a, as a mechanic for it. Uh, as for like how easy it is to do it, like everything you work with on mycelium if you don't have a lab or anything like that, you can still get expansion rates of, of 20 to one. So, you know, one mycelium plate can expand 20 times and then significantly keep going and going. So um, I can't remember the specific numbers, but I remember reading um, uh, the uh, mycelium running by Paul Stamets and right. how one jar of grain spawn in a couple of successive, successive runs could become like two tons worth of mycelium material because it just keeps expanding and expanding, uh, which is, is brilliant when it comes to, to manufacturing because you can start from such a small uh, genetic sample and then end up with enough grain spawn to, to fill a tower kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, but as for scalability, the, the main sort of uh, challenge that you have to, to solve with it is it does take time, um, similar to, to growing a tree again. Yeah. Um, but if you have a system in place where it's a, a continuous production per se, then it's not a case of the timeline anymore. It's it's um, it's just a constant flow of, of, of material. So, for example, uh, one of the companies I work for, Biome, that they are uh, producing mushroom insulation for the buildings. Um, so we're currently setting up a facility in, in Somerset in the UK to to produce all of this material to insulate about 30 homes per, per month, um, which is, is a huge amount. And that's just going to be the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how easy it is to expand it out to further locations, you know, putting factories in places strategically where there's a, a good amount of waste resources to, to rely on and things like that. But as for scalability, it's, it's relatively, in theory, easy because mycelium always is expanding it always is scaling up that's how it spreads it just wants to grow everywhere if you'd right. let it so it's, yeah it's infinitely scalable it, it always wants to scale you don't have to worry as much about the mycelium but i think it's really mm -hmm. interesting to understand that when we're talking about like products and materials a lot of it is the actual substrate and just in my mind it kind of clicked that whether mycelium is working as a digester of waste streams to literally break it down into nothing or ostensibly mushrooms you might even be able to eat turning waste into that that's mm -hmm. amazing or it's taking waste that is coming from an industry and then lacing it together and tying it together into a new structure so mm -hmm. there's kind of two applications like I, I don't know why that just clicked for me but, but yeah when you're making a chair you're making whatever you're making there can be a substrate in there the mycelium is growing on of some kind of waste that it's neutralized any toxicity element or anything you know mm -hmm. and turned it into something usable so I guess when you talk about scalability I mean industrial waste is infinitely scalable mycelium is infinitely scalable and I would guess too that, I mean, it's relatively climate independent. I mean, you're going to need a climate control facility mm -hmm. wherever you are. Yeah. So it turns places that maybe economically, especially when it comes to agriculture, traditional kind of ecological or, or those kind of industries aren't able to thrive there. It can turn those industries, it can turn those places 
into kind of economic powerhouses if they are able to set up, you know, a, a biomaterials facility or that that's really has a lot of like yeah. interesting economic implications mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah, exactly. And it, uh, it takes it a lot away from just harvesting resources from the ground and, and using, you know, what's available to you. Um, within Natura, the, the team are getting more and more sort of inclined to go to a, a coffee shop or go to a, a shop or anything and see this is waste. We could use that. Um, how could we create a product from that? And even more so, how can we build a story around that? Because a lot of the time products are more sort of accepted when there is actually a story to tell from it. Like, sure. you know, your grandfather's watch as such, uh, it has more value than it actually is presented in material because of the story. Uh, and it's a lot more, more sort of, uh, prized when, when someone asks you what your sort of most kept possession is. Um, so that it's, it's going to explode and, and we're already right. kind of seeing the, the sort of, pre-bubble uh, starting to burst. Uh, there is a lot of, of large companies which are, are really pushing it, but there's also a lot of individuals in, in this community, similar to the uh, mushroom cultivation uh, communities as well. It's very close-knit and also very tied towards the material uh, cultivation side of things, uh, more than people realize. I, The way that I learned how to do all my mushroom production was from... Uh, Tony Shields at Fresh Cat Mushrooms. I, I used oh, to that's cool. I go through all of his videos and, and make notes of his protocol. And strictly the, the material cultivation is, is mushroom cultivation, but without the last step. Right. Um, so there's a lot of uh, knowledge that can be gained from, uh, from this industry, which has already been growing for, for, for quite a while. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, of minds out there who sometimes don't even realize they could be a part of the material uh, side of, of, of fungi, um, having such huge insights, which are, are so valuable to, to sort of share and spread. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's really interesting to think about that overlap. Cultivators could be designing materials. Materials could be designing cultivate. I mean, the knowledge share and the mind share of just that community of just fungi cultivators in general has such a huge potential of uses yeah, we, I mean, we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg as more and more people collaborate and overlap and realize, you know, mushroom farms could be producing biomaterials, but they probably need your knowledge of how to then use it. And it, it really leads to exciting potential. And for me, I, I often think of the economics of it, too. It's really it's just exciting to think the economy can run more off these things that are sustainable for the planet and are, you know, sometimes we think that we're kind of stuck in the train that we're on when it comes to a modern society with manufacturing and like, no, fungi offer this hope of a future that you don't have to sacrifice, you know, mod cons, you don't have to sacrifice progress exactly. to yeah. still have an economically vibrant and high tech society. We just need to get more creative and use, you know, the materials that are, that are, sustain that are right here that are more sustainable um, yeah especially when it comes to design itself like I, i've always been uh in the belief that there is there must be alternatives out there which doesn't compromise the actual beauty of of an object right and yeah i mean with the the mycelium side of things maybe i'm slightly biased because i see beauty in in where it's come from but um a lot of the the products that we try to do we, we're trying to sort of capture that that essence of beauty and make it more accessible and, and acceptable to uh, the general population um and yeah we shouldn't have to compromise on on sort of what we like to build around our lives uh, like you know our rooms our our lives we we buy objects to basically become a physical uh, version of our personality it's almost like a peacock um, as such. Right, so right. you shouldn't shouldn't have to compromise on that, which is, is the biggest thing that stops a lot of people swapping from, you know, say plastic products or products which aren't necessarily um, uh, beneficial for, for the environment to, to ones that can be. Uh, the only difference is, you know, how much do you have to compromise when it comes to it? Um, so, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's the perfect segue into Natura. And what you guys are doing, what products you're creating. And I thought it was interesting too, the story of how it formed. 
it was someone who's from the industrial design side of things. So you're ecological, he's industrial, perfect. Yeah. That future we're just talking about where you don't have to sacrifice industry and modernity and everything for something that's ecologically friendly. You don't have to be a Luddite. Um, so what was kind of the synchronicities or sequence of events that had you connect back with Samuel and start the, the studio now? So it was kind of like yin and yang, um, where it's always been joked around that I'm sort of the hippie of the group, um, <laughs> whereas uh, Sam was was very uh, inept at uh, being really specific with CAD and really understanding the man uh, mechanical processes that go into creating a product. And it, we sort of saw together that, in essence, you need to merge mo both of those things together for this industry to, to move forwards because you can't create materials that don't uh, use similar uh, techniques to the current processes that we're using at the moment, like injection molding and things like that. Like the, if the whole system has to change, it's either not going to change or it's going to take too long to change. So you've got to learn right. the game to play it. Um, so that's where Sam came in. Sam's knowledge of, of the whole industry is, is massive. He works for, um, Kingfisher, which, uh, to Americans, it's going to mean nothing, but, uh, they own <laughs> companies like B and Q or home base, uh, which produce a lot of, um, like consumable products for the house and, and stuff like that. So he works quite heavily on, on producing these, uh, new products, but, um, so his knowledge comes in and, and, and puts a, an industrial side on things. Whereas, um, the free willed hippie of let's try this, let's, you know, go really wacky with it. And, uh, just recently, we also um, had another friend join the join the bandwagon, uh, Francesco Verderosa, who um, is the most talented illustrator that I've ever seen. And he oh, is wow. a, a mind printer. You tell him an idea and he sketches it. And the, that was something that as Natura, we were, were missing a lot. Um, and so we've had him come on the team recently and uh, we've seen... Uh, everything go absolutely crazy um, with ideas. It's uh, we're having to, to steady ourselves slightly. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's become a, a crazy ship to be on and there's quite a lot of exciting things planned for the future. Some of which I can't really talk about yet just to put some suspense in there, but um, right, the, yeah. we're, we're hoping to, to expand massively over the next year and, and really, um, nailed down the educational side of things as well um, because it's such an emerging industry and the more minds that we have working on it the better so um, we're, we're sort of pumping in quite uh, quite strongly into the the sort of educational side of things so doing workshops but also doing lecturing at universities and, and things like that and just on an individual basis we're uh, we're very open with our processes and stuff and if people get in touch wanting to, to learn how to do what we're doing, you know, we'll invite them over or if, if we can't meet face to face or online, but we'll show people how to do the exact same processes that we that we are working with because it's something that shouldn't be kept secret uh, or, you know, kept as a underground kind of business. I think it, like power to the people sort of thing. If, if right. uh, someone wants to, to, you know, join the, the mushroom bandwagon and become one of those weirdos wandering around the forest, then hats off to them. Uh, you know, it's, I would love to see a couple of forests uh, in the future just absolutely crowded with people trying to find this one material mushroom, which will be the, the, the Jesus mushroom to create all uh, the new all gold products. rush. The new exactly. gold rush is for mycelium. I, exactly. I think it's, I mean, you're in this exciting gestation period of a new industry. You've got this team that brings disciplines that are all necessary. I mean, you've got you who starts with a far out kind of idea, like, can we do this? Then you've got someone to like bring it down from the mind into the visual. You've got an amazing illustrator now that's a key middle piece. And then you've got your actuator who's like, okay, let's bring that into CAD. Let's figure out how we make it. What are the, like, that's such a potent combination. And what I'm struck by is how hard it must be to just focus on one thing. I mean, even just when you start talking about mushrooms or fungi, like for me, 
obviously I get into everything. I'm interested in absolutely mm -hmm. everything. And with your guys' knowledge and background, you could contribute to workshops and vast educational programs. You can make materials. You can do micro remediation and repurpose waste streams or digest waste stream. Like, how do you decide what to do? Now, that's part of the reason why I ended up doing a podcast. I couldn't focus on anything. And I just want to talk to everybody about all these interesting <laughs> things. So a podcast is the perfect avenue to do that. But I, it just, to me, it's like, how do you even select a focus or where to start? So I guess right now with Natura, I, I saw the products that you're making. We talked about you're repurposing spoon shavings into bowls. So what is kind of the the kind of more short-term goal? Is it, the, is it the blend of like educational, some great products, some working with bigger industries to help provide consulting solutions for them? Um, or, or what is kind of the short-term offering or thing that I mean you, you summed it up perfectly yeah you summed it up perfectly okay. it's uh, it's a blend between them uh, for me personally education has always been a passion of mine but then also you've got to work with companies that are sort of eager to to get their toe in the in the pond um, sure. and and then of course we the the whole team at Natura are all product designers and our natural default is to be making things so um, I think we would be biting our fingers off if we weren't at least producing our own uh, products. And it also comes from a fact of, uh, you know, showing that what you're saying is actually in practice possible. It's not a right. case of um, theory and, and hearsay. It's, you know, here I've proved that this is how you do it. This is how you can work with it. And so I think it's the default for, industries or, or, or small like startups like that to be in that level and especially I would uh, really encourage uh, people in that position to educate further because I, I think like I was going uh, on about before it's a lot about spreading the the information and getting more minds on it because Absolutely. everybody's mind works slightly different they're going to piece different things together depending on their life experiences or their environment they're in so you know you, you couldn't ever expect one person or even a, a couple of people to be able to come up with all the ideas. Um, so why not, you know, branch it out massively? Like in, say, Africa, where uh, the, there's starting to be a lot of um, mushroom production there on a very low DIY scale where they're using uh, propane burners under barrels to pasteurize substrate and things. The, their actual, like, learnings and experiences are sometimes more potent than the ones that I find around me because they're in such a tight uh, pressured system where, you know, how do you make it the cheapest? How do you make it the most like low cost, low DIY? Um, like how do you make it work? And, and right. from those stresses, you get some of the most uh, wackiest um, sort of creations coming from it. And it's always interesting to see what other people's experiences are and what opinions or ideas they, they can have and, and bring to the table. So I think, I mean, I would love to, it's already naturally formed as it is, but I would love to see a more um, connected uh, material industry where um, individuals are constantly working with, it, with with each other and networking, similar to how the mycelium works as such, uh, to always bring it back. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it, I would love to, to see that because, I mean, in the uh, mushroom cultivation industry, there is uh, some level of, of competition, but there is also right. a, a friendly level of um, so helping each other out. There's a lot of uh, forums where you can, you know, ask a question and you will get the most experienced people in the industry commenting. Uh, um, like, I mean, even even Tony Shields and people like that will uh, be there giving out advice, even though they probably have some of the busiest lives ever running these <laughs> operations and yet right. they still have time to just uh, help out a, a fellow uh, mushroom fanatic. There, uh, there is something altruistic, it seems like, by most people who are into mushrooms or fungi. The ethos that you just said of, you know, I want to share this knowledge. I want this to be as open source as possible because if you, as as kind of a real change maker, someone's changing the world into a, something that we kind of all envision as a better future, you want to share that with people and not limit it and not make it like this competition. And that's part of the mindset that needs to change if we are going to implement widespread change, not only using, like you said, the apertures and structures already in place, but 
using those systems and then also changing people's minds to maybe get a little less competition oriented, more collaboration, because it's really going to help everyone. And I think that's something that people work with mushrooms or mycelium. They naturally gravitate toward that mindset. I think like you're saying, probably biomimicking their subjects a little bit, biomimicking mm -hmm. the mycelium and working Definitely. together and connecting together. Uh, and I just think that's such the right attitude to have. And it also gives permission for people when you say like, hey, there's never going to be enough minds or enough viewpoints or enough people taking action on this or excuse me, there's never going to be too many. There's never. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about it, you're interested in it, start you know, getting into it, start sharing, start educating mm -hmm. in your local area. That's one thing that often stopped myself was thinking, oh, there are the Tony Shields, the Paul Stamets. There's already people spreading the good word. It's, but no, this is a massive shift. The potential of what we've been talking about, the potential of fungi is so massive. And to really make it a widespread change and make everyone cognizant of that is going to take a certain quanta of voices, a certain like, so it's it's a really inclusive worldview and also an encouraging to actually like a call to action worldview of like, hey, there's always room for you to contribute what you've mm -hmm. got to to the world of fungi. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the sort of system that I always look up to is is mycorrhizal mushrooms where they grow in partnership with trees and they connect all the trees in the forest together. And for example, if one tree has its canopy chopped down or it's injured and it's not producing enough food for itself then the mycelium will redirect nutrients from the fellow trees around it to support this tree and nurse it back to health. And I think having that same kind of viewpoint when it comes to being in like an industry, maybe less so when it comes to banking or anything like that, because the there is no benefit as such to that um, unless you're yeah. a, a, in a communistic uh, 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 society as such. But, um, you know, just like connecting and this free sharing of, of information and not really focusing on what profit there is to be made out of it. Because, I mean, it's it's a very, like, stoic point to make, but what's the point in saving up money for, you know, successive generations of yourself, like your your uh, sons and daughters, when there might not be somewhere for them to, to live happily uh, in 100 years' time? So why would you work yourself harder than you needed to and try and take more slice of the pie than you need to if there isn't actually any future to use it on. Um, so, yeah. And I think what you're kind of outlining is a difference I've been talking with people about recently of kind of the focus on creating value versus creating profit. Because mm -hmm. creating profit, you know, there's a number of ways to do that, whether it's exploiting the people that contributed that, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to create a higher profit margin. Whereas if you focus on, hey, how can I create the most value? That might not even translate monetarily. But mm -hmm. How much can I create the most value for the planet, for successive generations? How can I create the most value in terms of the innovation that I'm offering to other people? You know, And naturally, profit comes out of that, but almost in a way that's more self-regulating, sustainable, if you're constantly focusing on how do I create value versus mm -hmm. how do I create more and more profit that ends up having the negative externalities that we associate with rapacious capital, capitalism and, you know, some of the things about our system that, you know, I, I, we're all kind of formulating our opinions on what economic models work the best and everything else. But I think that <laughs> general focus, like, I, I want to say, like, you know, I don't, I guess I don't hate capitalism. I, I'm not sure I understand any of the methodologies enough to hate or love another. But I think what the key is, is forming kind of a new system. Like, we're always forming something new. We don't have to choose from existing systems of thought, we're always kind of forming something new. And I think a shift like you're talking about of what am I contributing? What am I making? How am I turning this thing I found in the woods to something we can apply? That kind of value enhancement in a way that's sustainable should be the focus rather than how do I make money? How do I make profit? Mm -hmm. That's a theme I've seen with you because you know you are the hippie mushroom guy. Of course, that's, <laughs> of course, that's the mindset you gravitate to. But I, but I think... It's going to take more hippie mushroom guys to change this planet, like us, to change this planet into something that that is more imbalanced and self regulating, you know. And and it might not be something we have to think about too hard. Just keep doing mm -hmm. stuff like you're doing, being inspired, applying knowledge and applying novel ideas to ways that create better products, better systems, better, and that will naturally rebalance and settle into mm -hmm. a new system potentially. Yeah, I mean, I think even. Um going down to the core of, of how that shift could happen. It's, you know, 
if people, if everybody followed their passion rather than actually uh, working for sake of working, then I think the society would be a lot, a lot more different. We're sort of in the balance now where, especially for like the UK, where we had World War Two, where you, you were working for the country, you were working, you know, to for the whole civilization as such. But now we're getting to a point where we don't need to work for a country or anything like that. And it's okay to actually chase what you enjoy doing. And I mean, it must be a very small percent of people who, through following their passion, negatively impact people and the environment. Right, like, right. It's only psychopaths who, who <laughs> sort of go down that route. Um, you know, like who, who would go around saying their passion is burning trees? Uh, it's it's right. very rare to actually find someone's passion to be you know, harmful or, or, or nasty because passions are, are very pure and, and it's, it's very beautiful as well. Um, and deep down, no one wants to, to be that monster or anything like that. It's a lot of people are working just because they don't see an option and they think that the only way forward is, is just to, uh, just to get that paycheck at the end of the month and, and continue. But I mean, like I understand the, uh, the sort of imbalance with the not just the economy but just societies in general across the world um not everybody has that option to and that will be something that's probably the biggest challenge that the, the world ever faces of how can we get it all balanced that everyone has that right to chase what they love rather than having to chase to survive um so yeah i mean for for me it was just uh a calling that I had to to keep going on and it's led me down some weird routes where I'm now uh, living in a van traveling around London for my work uh, or you know on the weekends if I want to uh, to go and explore the forest I can simply just drive away park up and and sleep wherever I want to put my house and it allows you to chase your passions without having the sort of overheads of, of having a full life um or a full commitment uh to to sort of keep going so yeah and i think as more and more people adopt that kind of lifestyle where it is about redefining success it is about seeking true satisfaction in terms of the impact you're making in the world it is about chasing your passions as more people do it that makes the system based around that you know it's people right now how would i sustain myself or if we have a system where there is everyone doing that There'll be natural systems by which we support each other. There'll be whole new shifts in how the economy works as people mm -hmm. tend toward, you know, because it's the age old thing. People want to do art, but how would I make money from it? I know so many people that want to be artists. Please give yeah. me a world where we have like 5 billion artists. Like mm -hmm. it will be an amazing planet. And what we consider valuable, which is the heart of any quote unquote economic system, will shift dramatically. And yeah, suddenly exactly. you'll see a world more based around beauty and art and those things will be valued at even more so maybe the money and maybe we'll be more in a society where, you know, the the money that you're making doesn't dictate your status as much. And so yeah, we're we're talking super macro, but I think the <laughs> principle but I think the principles we're talking about can lace out and apply that widespread change once we get to a higher level. So that kind of goes back to sharing the message more with people putting yourself out there, collaborating as a community, um, because there's never going to be enough change makers, you know, sharing their opinions, sharing their voices. There can't ever be too many. There can't ever be enough to implement the kind of widespread change that, that we're talking about that I think most people intuitively agree that a shift like that probably has to happen. I think most people now realize the current kind of Western cultural model that's spread through much of the world isn't sustainable as it is not to say all parts of it are bad there are parts of it that are amazing and as humans we are part of a natural system that self-regulates and self-balances so we'll probably get there but mm -hmm. it's going to be through more of a focus yeah. on the simple things like passion and and following following your heart as it were um <laughs> so <laughs> just to just to get through a couple questions that i had bef um before we get into kind of future and wrap up and everything else just going back to micro materials again, if we can now go from this giant expanded macro awareness down to the micro, um, just because I'm curious, when you're making, like I know the one of your main products right now is the bowls, just so mm -hmm. people know when you're making the bowls, how are you putting them into that form? 
Um, I know you're using the waste substrate from wooden spoons. So how are you putting them into that bowl form and then holding it there? That's one question that I have a lot about microbacteria. How do you make it grow to a certain form and then keep it there? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for anyone who is familiar with growing mushrooms in general anyway, you'll understand that the substrate block, when you form it into that bag and let it sit, if you leave it for a little too long, it becomes a solid, solid mass, which you can't really break. So you simply just need to, to create a form for the mycelium to, to rest in, and it does the rest of the work for you. It, it sort of conforms to that shape and, and uh, builds its structure around that. So, for example, with the bowls, um, just having two two separate uh, molds to to form it to, you simply um, inoculate your your substrate as you would be if you were growing mushrooms. You let the mycelium colonize the the, uh, the block, and then you break it up and then reform it and hold it in that shape uh, for usually about one to two weeks. And then once that's done, you can take it out and then you can dry it, and you've got your fully uh, fully inert and finished uh, mycelium product um so the the process of actually molding it is relatively low tech right to, as much as you could just get a glass out of your kitchen and pour some mycelium in and put some cling film and let it sit for a little bit and then all of a sudden you've got this wedge of mycelium so you know the you're only limited by your ability to make the molds um right. really at this point um it's always been the biggest challenge that we we face because the, the the problem with mycelium is it digests anything organic so therefore when it comes to molds you've got to be really sort of oh, yeah. careful as to what you're using for right. example you couldn't use a wood mold like you would be able to use for resin or anything like that because it digests it which is the most frustrating side but laughable side to it as well it's just um you've really got to it's like that child that doesn't behave uh or it's like <laughs> No, just like please, please grow right. Uh, don't leave this alone. I've given you what you need. Well, and even plastic, um, even plastics aren't safe. It sounds like my still makes exactly. plastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 day that I retire, no matter how wealthy I am at that point, is when it digests its way out of a petri dish. I'll be like, yep, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> I've achieved what I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. And then we just see um, the the uh, world's amount of plastic just get eaten away like some kind of post-apocalyptic uh uh show and i'll be sat there in my wooden chair just you know watching the world panic as to why they can't use plastics anymore which you know it's, it's uh extreme but i would be i would be sat there smiling <laughs> at that point but you know yeah that's that's the goal that's the goal I, that's something i was really interested in and it sounds like people can actually like there is a diy mica materials as long as you can get those molds this is very much something that you know could be people making materials for themselves making cottage industries as you know you learn more and more so in that vein of kind of empowering people to take on biomaterials what are the skills that you think really help people do you think there needs to be kind of a baseline understanding of biology um what are some of the skills that Obviously, we've talked about your team and what it represents, but wh yeah, what skills would you recommend or what resources would you recommend to people who want to start making their own mm -hmm. biomaterials? When it comes to skills, for sure, the main one, which fruits from everything, is just persistence. Um, if you're coming into this industry and you, you aren't familiar with uh, biology or growing or anything, you're going to have a lot of failures, but you slowly start to, to get to a point where you almost crack it. Uh, it becomes a, a quick transition between a lot of the stuff you're doing is failing to then actually everything or most of the stuff you're doing is succeeding. And a lot of that is just trial and error and persistence. Um, I, like I said before, I'm pro design trained. I didn't have any biology experience before going into this. Right. When I first started, I, I started by taking mushrooms from the forest chopping up into pieces and putting that into substrate and hoping that it was growing. No sterile procedure at all. <laughs> and of course, all of them failed. And, and through those failures, you ask yourself, like, what did I do wrong? What do I need to change? And then you end up spending a lot of time on, on uh, online forums or just getting in touch with individuals. That's one of the big things I would recommend to everybody. Just if there is someone who, not even necessarily in just the mushroom industry, but if there's a skill that you're wanting to learn, Go and find someone who's doing it better than you are and be like, 
you know, do could you spare some time uh, and and show me how you do it? And there is a lot of uh, beautiful things that come from that, as well as you being able to advance yourself really quickly, because these people have been through your the experiences you're going to go through. They know the trials and they know the errors most of all. Uh, so you know, it's uh, that's the best way to to learn for me. I I got in touch with a lot of people. I, I first started really uh properly in this industry with uh, sebastian cox producing the uh the lights uh, the lampshades for him and that was a a learning curve and a half to really unpick this process and and try and figure out how to optimize it um but as for before then it was simply just me with a box that i'd made into a glove box working in my parents kitchen and uh just having these weird objects growing around the house uh, to which, you know, my parents were like, what, what is going on here? Right. Um, but you know, when they started to actually see the fruits of the labor and see the things coming out, it, uh, you know, you, you get more and more momentum, more and more passion and more persistent with keeping on going. Right. And, um, it's certainly a, an industry that doesn't stop moving and it doesn't stop changing every single day. I find out something new. Um, and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. So, when it comes to actual skills, just persistence, just keep going and try wacky things. If someone says it isn't going to work, do it. Because I say that to everyone who I teach. I was like, everything I say, don't take it for granted. You can, you know, absolutely ruin these procedures that I, I've taught you and see if they work. Because the, the people that change the industry are going to be those ones that try something wacky and it actually works. Right. And um, it's always... Uh, it's always interesting to see those developing as well. And just, yeah, people have these weird ideas, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but resource-wise, yeah, just get in touch with people that are in this industry and just spend a lot of time on the internet, really. A, a lot of uh, my knowledge, like I said, came from Fresh Caps watching his videos um, or on uh, sites like streamery.org and stuff like that because it's all the same uh, processes. It's just slightly different when it comes to the end product and uh, it, it starts to become more of an art form of how you can sort of grow these weird ty types of textures and these weird kind of forms uh, and it becomes kind of yeah like a weird urban gardener as such because it's never really done in the outdoors on a, on, a, a, on a quest for wild textures and properties exactly, and materials yeah. from all different kinds of, of mushroom mycelium yeah, exactly. So, yeah, just jump in and just get get some grow it yourself kits. Get some, you know, grow your own oyster mushrooms and start playing around with it. It doesn't necessarily have to be focused on the materials. It could right. just be getting a passion and learning how the biological systems work because you learn a lot from just watching how it grows and trying different conditions. Like, oh, clearly I've you know overwatered it or I've I've overcooked it or anything like that. And you learn you learn just through through trying really. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think that's, I think that's an amazing message. It's something I hear echoed with a lot of people in mushroom cultivation in areas of mushroom science, have persistence, understanding the first thing you'll learn about is failure. You know, your resources, we have like most things, the best resource is the internet and the community that you can, <clears throat> excuse me, the community you can tap into. And especially when it comes to fungi and mushrooms, the community is, mm -hmm. as we've been talking about, super open generally ready to help, especially if you come at it from a place of like, hey, I just want to learn and get started. I found that resources just consistently avail themselves to you once you make that decision that I'm going to yeah. kind of go into this and really get in, get proper stuck in to this thing. Yeah, we're going to we're going to you're going to find the help that you need out there. Um, so I think that's I think that's an awesome set of of kind of principles and, and traits to have if you're going to start working with biomaterials. And I had some other questions. Obviously, we can do like 50 podcasts about this. And I do want to have you on in the future when you guys start some of these other projects, but just a quick hit list of the current things nature is working on. I know we've covered them throughout, but just a quick hit list of the things nature is working on now. Yeah. So the, the main things we're working on is, is trying to get some pieces, uh, sort of exhibition style, large scale to sort of really illustrate what you can do with micro materials because wow. we, we, we want to get everyone started on the same thing as soon as possible, rather than us trying to, uh, you know, 
because like create a commercial line for some products before anyone else even knows about it um it just seems like as a collective it's a way to shoot yourself in the foot if you're not screaming about it before you focus on it completely so like i say we're doing a lot with education um we're doing a lot of workshops that we're going to try and focus a lot on um uh doing stuff like that and um uh, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks or maybe a, a month um we'll be coming out with a little uh, uh book or booklet about how uh you can basically just pick it up yourself and and get on with it because it's something which is lacking in this industry like a collection of uh, sort of experience to to be able to draw from uh but of course dismiss if you want to try something wacky um right, right. so that's sort of where we're focusing on and um yeah just uh, various uh projects on products that we're just trying to to tickle with and and just get our footing uh with what direction we're wanting to to focus on um so yeah yeah well i'm really excited about your guys work i can't wait to have you on to talk more in the future where can people find nature where can people find more information reach out to you guys i'm sure there are people listening even that might want to contribute or you know might have things to bring to bear so where can people find you so mainly we're on Instagram. It's okay. a platform that we can uh, really be open and show the visuals on what's going on. So you can find us um, at Natura underscore studios. Uh, and uh, we're really responsive on there if you want to uh, hit us up or, you know, just have an explore on, on some of the weird stuff we're doing. But um, we also have a website, naturadesign.org, um, where we sell some of our products. And uh, soon we're going to be moving into um, being able to provide equipment and stuff like that for people wanting to to move into the material uh, industry. Um, so yeah, and if people want to get in touch, hit me an email. There's a contact form there. Um, I always love chatting about mushrooms. So um, especially if people are in the UK, uh, I'd love to meet for a uh, for a drink and just talk all things fungal and uh, yeah, uh, just get in touch. Yeah, he's an open book about fungi materials, biomaterials, please take advantage of it. And I, I think overall you are offering a really approachable insight and really approachable path for people to start working with biomaterials. Uh, you didn't come off as someone who's overly scientific. You know, you've kind of broken it down to the most fundamental levels and explained the limitless potential. And I think, I mean, that gets me excited. I'm ready to go home and like grow a mushroom bowl now. Uh, right. I mean, it's I, something I to see some photos soon. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's something. I mean, I say this with a lot of people I podcast with. You've inspired me to do exactly what you're doing now. Like, I want to try this. So, definitely, I, I'm hoping to see more and more people. I think. I don't know if you're familiar with Will Padilla Brown. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's been doing some posts about microbacterials, and it's like hugely inspiring. He's not doing it in any kind of with crazy. Although he has it, he's not using crazy like lab equipment or he's just making growing bowls and growing things. And I, I think that's really cool. And I think you've made it really, really approachable for people. So I appreciate that. So the last three quick hitters I have, what is a far out application of mycelium on the horizon? I mean, we've talked about circuitry and buildings and everything, but what is something if we haven't already talked about it, that is like a future sci-fi potential for mycelium? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, for me, my passion always drops down to uh, micro-materials, but in space, because you can uh, just grow it off the waste that is based there. It can digest most substrates, so you could train it to eat anything organic, wherever you are. So, you know, maybe in the future, it's uh, making materials from the waste of us humans while traveling across the stars. Um, but the other one is, is mushroom compost bins to digest plastics. Um, yeah, that Which, that one is that would be uh, amazing to see. That one yeah. is hugely like hugely <laughs> important. Like, like I hope a, we see that not. Pause. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I we I want to yeah. see that within the next few years. Like the spaceship traveling cubits across space, powered by mushroom digesters, amazing. But the plastic one, we need that like now. Uh, so that's awesome. You gave, <laughs> yeah. I think you gave perfect. You gave you gave the the great two answers there, and then. Name a mushroom that you really love and why. Oh, oh, Not a favorite. Uh, it could so just be for today or. Yeah, it's uh, definitely going to be a honey fungus. So Armillaria mm -hmm. malilia. Um, just, I mean, so as you know yourself, uh, for sure, the 
is the largest uh, organism on the planet uh, based in Oregon, the humongous fungus. But um, I really love working with it because it's, uh, it glows in the dark when it's alive. It looks like something out of Stranger Things. And um, when I first started working with it, I heard a story from a, a veteran mushroom forager that in uh, World War One and Two in Scandinavia, wow. they used to, uh, if you lost a button off your um, uh, uh, uniform, if you knew where honey fungus was, you could run a uh, bayonet under the soil to pull up some of these fibers to then stitch buttons back on. So from a material side of view, it may already have implications far reaching than what we already know as, as nowadays uh, uses. So I think so, yeah. That's an amazing story. I love that. I'm going to look at honey mushrooms even uh, with even more reverence now. The ability to stay. That's really cool. <laughs> That's really cool. And then I was going to ask about the lasting impact you hope to make. I think we covered like the huge lasting impact that's potential here. Mm -hmm. So I want to say, do you feel like you, there's kind of a, a spiritual connection that you have with mushrooms aside from psychedelics? Obviously that's its whole universe, but, or maybe including that, but do you feel like a spiritual connection with mushrooms and mycelium? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, just as, as, potent as if it would be growing some plants in a garden kind of thing you you look after these beings you see them grow and develop and it becomes even though it's something which isn't really relatable in a uh, sort of personified way you kind of see them as as your little creatures and and um, you're watching them grow and develop so for me there is a lot of passion within that but as it comes as it goes to like lasting impact I don't want to leave any impact. That's the whole point. I want to <laughs> leave no trace whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I, that would be ideal. Um, just, yeah, just the, the, maybe the knowledge of, and the developments of the industry, but, but when it comes to physical trace, absolutely, absolutely none. So, yeah. When Ashley's gone, there'll be no remnants except for all the knowledge that he spread in people's <laughs> brains across the planet. But I don't think you're going to be able to get away with, like they're going to have a mushroom sculpture of you. So I don't think you can get away from that as a microminerals guy. <laughs> Doesn't last long outdoors. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You have to keep regrowing it. <laughs> that's that's true. You have to constantly make the the Ashley statue. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. We've gone over an hour, but it's well worth it. I can't wait to talk with you more in the future. And uh, yeah, hopefully we're planning on maybe a trip to England before too long because now we know so many people over there. So oh, we'd love yes. to connect and, yeah. and see the mad scientist lab you guys have built over there. Definitely, definitely. It's been an absolute pleasure being on here and it's been amazing to, to chat to you. Likewise, likewise, Ashley. Well, hey, thank you for the time. We'll talk soon. Thank you.